little bit more about the dot product, focusing on its role in projections and calculating work when you have forces, both physics. So one question that often comes up is, we have these formulas for the dot product. One of them is easy to calculate from compounds. The other is easy to calculate from geometric information. And we've seen that if you don't have the geometric information, but you do have the components, you can use the fact that they give the same answer to get some really interesting geometric information out of it. So, but a lot of people still say, well, but what is the dot product? You've told me about what it's useful for, or some facts about it, but what is it? How should I think about it? Well, that's kind of hard. It's not a familiar object, exactly. But we can get uh, a little closer to what is it by looking at projections. And it's really coming from this geometry again. We can't really understand what it is unless we think about it geometrically. This is all well and good, but it's really a geometrical object. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at this, and I'm just going to separate out this part and this part. In the, what I, in the previous video, I separated out the cosine theta and moved this all over. Now I'm going to separate it out in a slightly different way. I'm going to leave this all together. And I'm going to note that there's a geometric significance to that. If I just drop the altitude here, drop a tude, as they say, then this is a right triangle. And hypotenuse times cosine theta, oh, that's exactly that length. So that's magnitude of V cosine theta. And so what this is, is it's the magnitude of U times, and we'll use the book's notation for this, it's the component of V in the direction U. So we put this as a subscript because it's sort of, once you picked U, you get a machine that says project onto U, and you can project any vector. So this is what determines what machine you're interested in, the component on U machine, and this is that function eating the vector V and producing a number. It's just a number here. We'll talk about a vector version in a minute. If you looked in the book already, you'll know that that's coming. Um, and so the dot product, there's two ways to see this, as usual. You can either say, if I'm comfortable with the dot product, it tells me, hey, here's a formula for something geometric that I might be interested in. And I used to think I needed to know about angles and magnitudes to do that. Well, I don't quite need to know quite so much geometry as I thought. And I get a formula that's entirely expressible in terms of components. This is easy in components. This is easy in components. And it gives us that, that component, that, that length of that projection. Now, I say length. I should be real careful about that. Remember, this can be negative. This cannot. This cannot. But cosine theta can be, can be negative. And so this can be plus or minus or zero in exactly the same pattern as I showed before. It's going to be plus when these are generally in the same direction. And it's going to be negative if V was generally pointing the opposite direction to you. And so again, it tells me it is, is how much is V going in the direction of U? And that can be a negative number if it's more or less going in the opposite direction. For example, if you happen to be I, you know, equals 1, 0, or 1, 0, 0 if you want to be in three dimensions, and I take V, and let's say that's equal to, oh, these should be angle brackets, and let's say that's like 3, 2, then what am I going to get? Oh, that, that looks like 2 comma 3, doesn't it? Let's do 2 comma 3. I would expect the component of V in the direction of I to just be the, the I component of, the, of that vector. Well, that's what I'm going to get. 2 comma 3 dotted with 1 comma 0 is going to give me just 2. And then I divide by the magnitude of a unit vector, which is 1. And so I just end up getting 2. So this is a generalization of how you break a vector into components along the I, J, K. But this doesn't, this U doesn't have to be I, J, K. It can be more complicated. That's a really powerful thing to be able to do. It's the kind of thing we would have basically been able to do with the linear algebra techniques, but it's faster. Um, because we're taking it into account some more geometry. So that's one perspective. If I know I want to calculate this and I like algebra, I say this is equal to this. But another good way to think about it is if you want more understanding of the dot product, you say, this is still somewhat mysterious gadget. Its meaning basically is magnitude of u times the component of the other guy, uh, v in the direction of u. Now, of course, it's symmetrical. It's also the magnitude of v times the component 
of you in the direction of me. That's interesting. So if I take this guy and project it this way, I don't, that's not 100% obvious. That this length times this length is equal to the projected vector length times the length of v. But it's true fact because of the symmetry of the dot product, the fact that it doesn't matter if I take u dot v or v dot u. That's obvious from the algebra, but it's not obvious from the geometry. And so, again, we've proved a cool geometry fact using algebra. Okay. So one of, the kind, one of the places where you do this idea, where you do projections, is when you're studying work in physics. And we don't, we're not going to go into physics a lot here. But when I've got, uh, suppose I've got some sort of block. And just to be simple, let's say it's sliding like on ice. So there's no friction. And then I have a rope attached to it. And I'm pulling on that rope at a diagonal. And I know the force vector here. And, um, but it's, I'm sliding along. I'm not actually pulling it in that direction. It's sliding along here. And so the motion, let's call it D for displacement, is not in the same direction as the force. And so let's say that front edge of the block co goes from a point P to a point Q. And so D is the vector from P to Q. And we know if you gave me the coordinates of the points P, Q, we subtract those to get the vector between P, Q. That was in, that's in that first 12.2, uh, I guess, the section of a vector's introduction. So the question is, how much work have I done on this object? Or another way, sort of how much energy have I expended in doing this? And the interesting fact, and the not at all obvious fact, is that um, if I have a force, so the, the, the usual example is if I have a force like gravity that pulls down always, and I move an object perpendicular to the direction of that force, then I actually do no work. You might think, well, it takes some effort to move my hand, but in fact, it's not just it's not really because I'm moving the chalk so much, it's because I'm just there's a bunch of friction and stuff within my hand. I'm not really imparting any energy to this chalk by moving it sideways. And it's not giving me any energy. Whereas if I lift something up, I really do actually have to do work against gravity. Another way to say that is I'm giving it potential energy. And here that potential energy is coming, is giving itself to me. So those are not super intuitive ideas. It took a long time for humans to figure those out. But that's an interesting fact. And notice what we have. We have two things. We have the force of gravity going down. And we have the motion vector. So we're comparing two vectors. And we get this thing where we get a positive amount of work if they're generally in the same direction. Oh, yeah, if they're generally in the same direction, gravity and the motion. We get a negative amount of work. Um, I'm losing energy, basically. I have to give it up if. Uh, they're in the opposite direction, where gravity's pointing down and the motion's up, and it's zero when they're perpendicular. That sounds suspiciously familiar. And in fact, it turns out that the work is given exactly by f dot d. So let me just, again, give this very hand wavy just justification. Again, it has the right kind of behavior in terms of direction. It gives positive when they're in the same direction, Zero when they're perpendicular, negative when they're opposite. Another property of the dot product that I discussed, I've kind of waved my hands about, didn't prove, but it's in the book, is that if I double the force, I double the dot product. Well, that seems to make sense for work. If I double the force and don't change the displacement or their angles, I should do twice as much work. If I go twice as far, I double D, I should do twice as much work. So that's suggesting that this is, this is on the line. And it, in, it indeed is the correct formula. So this is a nice thing. It's, well, it's good and, bo good and bad, but... It's bad because it's talking about a physics concept, which not everybody has intuition for, and it's in fact one of the less intuitive physics concepts, because there's, there's some misconceptions you can have about work. That's what's bad about it. What's good about it is that this isn't f dot d divided by the magnitude of f. It's not f dot d divided by magnitude of f magnitude. It's exactly the dot product. This is the first time I've said, here's a physical or geometric concept, and it is given exactly by the dot product, not by a further modification of the dot product. That's one reason why we introduced this right here because it's, it really is exactly the dot product. So for example, if the force had a magnitude of 50 newtons here, 
and the displacement was five meters. And this angle, I didn't draw them coming out of the same place, but here's the angle. The angle is 30 degrees. Then I can use the geometric formula. That's 50 newtons times five meters times root three over two. And so that's uh, 125 root three. And the unit of work is newton meters. That's equivalent to joules. But that's a pretty profound fact because it's the equivalence of two forms of energy. So that was easy because I was given the geometric data. But if I was given it in components, I could just use the component formula. And that's what, maybe I'll end with that. Which formula you use to calculate the dot product depends on what data you're given. The most interesting dot product problems is the kind of thing I started with, where essentially you're using both formulas and you're playing them off against each other. But here, we're not really trying to do that. We're just trying to get the answer for the dot product. I gave the, the data here geometrically in terms of magnitude and direction, so we used the geometric formula for the dot product. If instead I had said f is given by the vector that goes 30 newtons to the right and has a component going 20 newtons up, and the displacement vector was given by going 5 meters to the right and 0 meters up, as it seems to be in the picture, then I'd get a rather different answer. And I'd do it in a different way. It would just be 30, 20, dotted 5, 0. It's all going to come out in newton meters. And that's going to be 150 newton meters. And so those are different problems with different kinds of data that correspond to roughly the same physics in the same picture, but um, they were given in very different languages. The component language, I use the component formula. The geometric language, I use the geometric formula. Okay, that's good for that one.